variable. Money is important, but it's not the only variable. And if you leave it as the only variable, it's who can outdo the other party. But the winnable deals are to say, hey, here's my price, but here's the other things. I can't be flexible on this, but there's other things that I can be flexible. And I think that that other area of flexibility is going to scratch where people are itching, it's going to tease out and meet the needs of those other people. And I think those are, that, those are creative negotiation solutions. This is The Fighting Entrepreneur, the podcast dedicated to entrepreneurs looking to change the world. Learn how to start, build, and scale a business in today's highly competitive business environment. Here's your host, The Fighting Entrepreneur, Anik Singhal. What's up, you crazy fighting entrepreneurs? It's your favorite person, Anik Singhal, back with yet another amazing episode talking about something us entrepreneurs need a lot of, but don't get any formal training in. I know that I've been doing this for now, what, I've been an entrepreneur for 16 years. I've never actually had a conversation about this, nor have I ever gotten official training on this. I've learned through the School of Hard Knocks, but man, what, what if I actually got a professional to teach me this? What am I talking about? Negotiation. You know, that's all we do in our lives. As a matter of fact, even if you're not an entrepreneur, if you just like live and exist and breathe, you're negotiating all the time with all the people around you. And today we've got with us a like an amazing negotiation expert who's going to share with us how to negotiate, how to be able to walk into places and get what you want in a favorable way, not by ripping them off, but by in, in a favorable way so that they also want to do business with you again and again. Now, before we get started, of course, remember onikpodcast.com, A-N-I-K podcast.com to get all of our show notes and to remember to leave us a great review go to learn.com l-u-r-n.com sign up for your free account we got tons of amazing courses all about entrepreneurship inside that platform make sure you're there and if you're on youtube make sure you hit subscribe leave us a comment as we have a conversation i check them all the time so without further ado i want to introduce to you our guest who's going to teach us negotiation mr randy cuts randy thank you so much for being on man i really appreciate you taking time to be here hey great to be with you Anik. yeah no i really appreciate it. now i titled this episode uh Powerful negotiation tactics straight from a former chief of staff in Congress. Now, we're going to talk about your background, and obviously that was a piece of it. I thought it was a really interesting title because I think if there's one thing you have to be damn good at if you're going to be on Capitol Hill, it's negotiating because that's pretty much 90% of the job. But that's not where you cut your teeth, Randy. I mean, I, I was, I was, as we did the pre-interview, I mean, your knowledge in this topic is, uh, it's crazy, right? I mean, you currently work with Scott Work Global Negotiation. With, they're like the world's foremost leading institution worldwide that teaches how to do negotiation. You've been negotiating for over 14 years. You started in the real estate space during the dot-com, I mean, sorry, not the dot-com, the real estate bust, and you were negotiating, he was negotiating with banks. So, I think you've probably negotiated in the most cutthroat environment at this point, um, which is which is why you've you know gone on to become a negotiating expert. So I'm really excited to have you here. But we do have a tradition. We always require this of our guests. So if you could please raise your right hand and repeat after me. Sure. All right. I, Randy Cuts. I, Randy Cuts. Do solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Do solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. And reveal all my top negotiation secrets. And reveal all my top negotiation secrets for a fee. No. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right. It's a negotiation, right? <laughs> it is. Absolutely. Um, Can't give all of it away. <laughs> no, no. We'll, we'll give enough away to get people started for sure because the world of negotiation, I mean, you've been learning it for well over a decade now and you're still learning every day. I know for me, for example, I still like every week I can tell if I look back and reflect, I'm like, man, I, I should have done that a little bit differently. Should have had that call a little bit differently. Should have had that meeting, should have made that request a little bit differently and, and we grow. Um, so Randy, I want to get right into it because your story is pretty powerful. Like how you became a negotiator, how you learned it. It's not like you were three years old and decided to start learning negotiation. Um, it was it was fairly recent. I mean, in the sense of a decade is not that long anymore in today's time. Um, but yeah, tell us a little bit about your story. You went from real estate to chief of staff in the Congress to now teaching negotiation. It feels like you've kind of you've been around the block, and I want to hear how one thing led to another. 
Sure. No, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, look, I, I was born and raised in Chicago by a single mom, five kids, and uh, I was toward the bottom of the rung. And so negotiation does start at an early age, I have to tell you. Um, my exit strategy was joining the Marine Corps at 17, uh, and that launched me, really launched my career in many ways because um, I got into the aviation space and uh, post-Marine Corps, uh, found myself working in, in business and worked for a division of Stanley Tools, uh, selling products, uh, tools, and is association, uh, associated test equipment and so forth um, in, in that space. And so I was a product marketing manager working with side by side with my procurement team, which were having to buy products. And so that's a negotiation endeavor right there. And you're going to find, of course, your listeners will find you're either on one side of, of being a buyer or you're on the other side of being a seller. Um, and it can be products, it can be uh, services, it can be ideas in the case of working in the Congress. So, uh, But fast forward, I found a, a, a compelling reason to be self-employed, an entrepreneur like your uh, whole entourage of listeners. And I, I went into real estate in 2006, which is right about this part of the market. <laughs> so uh, in Arizona, we were one of the hardest hit states. My business partner uh, and I, we formed a company. We wanted to grow a company. And uh, what we encountered very early on was a, a change um, in the market, a shift in the market, if you will. And um, uh, what happened in that particular situation is we... We, we were trying to help our clients in a rightful way. They needed to sell their home for all host different, re re different reasons. And as they were trying to do that, they found that they owed more on their house than they can sell it for. Uh, they didn't have a job or there was some life circumstance that required them to sell and they couldn't stay in it, couldn't afford it, couldn't sell it, they were trapped. And what the real options that, that were there for them was simply uh, to give it up and let it go to foreclosure or if they can negotiate a settlement with their bank and find a buyer, uh, then it could be a trifecta. The buyer gets a good deal, the bank doesn't take the property back, and the seller doesn't get the foreclosure on the market. And that, that's what we wound up going into and doing that business. What we found early on is that we were dealing with bank negotiators. That was their title. And my business partner and I really had no skills in that, formally speaking. So we got trained in negotiation, real estate negotiation, uh, and then went off and wrote some curriculum and trained other uh, real estate professionals uh, around the country in negotiation, specifically to help them in this market. So fast forward, in 2010, the market was uh, shifting back and uh, things were kind of getting a little bit re you know, redeemed in the market and the economic world. And uh, I had considered in a moment of insanity, uh, I had considered running for Congress. Um, I, I knew a member of Congress, uh, and had, had thought about that literally the next day after I heard of an open seat, the next day I heard that this member of Congress had uh, his chief of staff had left and he uh, had an open spot. And so my wife and I looked at each other, said, yeah, let's go and, and, and do that and uh, get behind someone that we know, we believe in and share you know, that particular policy. So 2010, we went to DC. Uh, and in the five years that it was there, I continued to teach negotiation as I could also went to Harvard for their program in negotiation, uh, did legislative negotiation, uh, took the U.S. Institute of Peace uh, in multilateral negotiation, and then continued to have this passion for training people because I, I really believe, uh, and, and then and I believe it now even more, that negotiation is a core competency. It's a foundational competency, uh, not only for professionals, but, but in your personal life as well. Uh, so came back after 2015, back to Arizona, got back into real estate negotiation space. Um, circumstances and businesses changed. And, uh, and, and then 2017, I stumbled upon an amazing company called Scottwork, who had been doing this for 43 years in, in uh, I don't know, 20, 30 different countries. They've taught in over 100 countries, but they have this regularly taught in like 30 countries and uh, multiple languages. And so they, they're the real deal. And I found an opportunity to bring together my passion with a company like that and help in the commercial space uh, beyond real estate, beyond public policy, uh, how to really help people um, transform and change their behavior at the bargaining table. And that's what we do. And that's what I'm really hoping to talk to your team about today. No, that's amazing. And 
gosh, so, so much education in um, the field of negotiation. I didn't even know there was that many different kinds of negotiation. So that this is going to be a powerful, uh, powerful episode. I'm excited. Well, you know what? I want to jump right in. So uh, for everyone who's listening, we've broken negotiation down into multiple rounds here. And uh, you got to get ready. You got to take notes because during the pre-interview alone, I was feverishly trying to take notes so that I could line up these rounds. I'm excited. So let's move right into round number two. All right, round number two, negotiation process versus outcome. Randy, when we were talking, you said this a lot. Um, Talk to me a little bit. What the heck is negotiation? How do you approach it? And what do you mean when you keep saying process versus outcome? Yeah, so great, great question. Uh, You know, a lot of times people approach negotiation, Anik, um, in in a way in which they're only fixated on what they want out of the deal. And so it's focused on the outcome. They don't really give much attention toward the process. And and I'm here to tell you that if you ignore the process, it's going to impact uh, the outcome. You think about negotiation itself, it's really just a form of of resolving conflict between two parties. In essence, anything can be negotiated uh, in reality. Everyone negotiates every single day. Uh, We just don't always do it effectively because we don't do it consciously. We almost do it subconsciously in a reactionary way uh, and uh, and ultimately it doesn't really go very well so yes there are a lot of different approaches to negotiations methodologies if you will um, and there are different ways of resolving conflict I, I would just say that negotiation is just one way to try to resolve conflict between parties um, there are other ways um, m- negotiation fundamentally is a is an activity of of give and take, and uh, and you have to trade for things. You have to give up things in order to uh, to be able to get uh, outcomes. Most of the time, though, with most negotiations, when people don't do it consciously or intentionally, they do it instinctively. They're bringing their worst self to the bargaining table, and they're focused again just on the outcome. Uh, the process, however, good negotiation really should be fixated on on what the process is, um, uh, because if you if you can prepare properly for the negotiation, uh, you're going to impact the outcome, but not only for this deal, but also for for future deals uh, as well. Competitive negotiators really think of negotiation as a zero-sum game. Uh, They approach the bargaining table seeking to win as much as they can, and they don't really care about uh, what the other party gets. Those might work for one-off deals, but you're just not going to have very many repeat business deals. And and your listeners, I know they're business people, they're business-minded, they're looking to grow businesses, and they, they want repeat business. That's how business grows, right, is they have repeat customers. You can get more customers, but if you get repeat customers, it's cheaper than trying to acquire new customers. And so you got to have uh, repeat business, and that's all about focusing on not only what you want from the deal, but also what your counterpart uh, wants from the deal as well. So, so when you say process, you, uh, you you mentioned preparing properly, which is actually what our round three is about. It's about how do you prepare for a negotiation. But is is a is like if you sit down at the table with someone, is there a certain process you go through? Like every negotiation goes through like step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, and then outcome. Is it like that or is every negotiation different? The process is different based on your preparation. Yeah, so uh, I think that the process can be fairly um, plain and boring, if you will. Um, It's not rocket science. The process of negotiation is not rocket science. Uh, But fundamental to any process is that you have to think through what it is that you want. So what what is that boring process? Like what are the steps? Sorry, I just wanted to catch that first. Yeah, so so um, I would give it to you this way. In a negotiation, prepare, prepare, prepare. The, the majority of, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like this. Um, you know, you, you prepare for the, for the negotiation and you, you act on the negotiation. Um, and the reason I, I, I want to sort of hedge a little bit, I don't want to like lay out and say, here's the formula, because that's what people are mostly looking for. They're looking for a, a formula that they can use every single time. And I'll just tell you, if you're going to have a formula, then you want to know who's coming to your negotiation, what is it that they want, and then how are they going to negotiate for what, it, for what they want. 
And so on the, uh, on the preparation side, if you will, you think about negotiation. First of all, first of all, negotiation, if you look at the etymology of the word negotiation, it, it really means work. <laughs> it means no leisure or without leisure. Negotiation is a is a uh, a process that you have to roll up your sleeves and do the work before you even come to the to the table. You have to do the work, and that's a work of preparing, not only on your side of the table but on the other side. I'll give you um, uh, an analogy. Um, my son, uh, he's a, he's a, a Marine Corps officer candidate. He's a, in a, a ROTC program, and he, he was on this long hike uh, hike for the for the uh, cadets that are doing this. And, and toward the end of the hike, it's about I don't know, 10 miles uphill, 70 pound pack. They're approaching their, their destination. They can see the summit. They can see where they're supposed to get to. And, um, and when they're approaching it, their, uh, their, their captain that was leading this whole uh, uh, group started barking out commands, keep going. You're not there yet. Go past the destination because that's not the destination. Uh, you're now entering into the mission phase. And so the idea afterwards and debrief and talking about it, I may draw drew great comparison uh, correlation to negotiation, that when you think about negotiation, you have to prepare not only just to get to the table, assessing what you want, but you have to prepare for what happens at the table. And that is taking into account what your counterpart wants as well. And so the, the message from this, this drill command uh, was, uh, was that the, the destination is not the mission. The destination gets you to the battlefield, but then the battle begins. And so negotiation is much like that. And if you only fixate and focus on what you want in the negotiation and not what the other party wants, you're only prepared to get to the table, but not what happens at the table. And, and most um, in, in, a, in a war mindset, uh, if you will, and I draw the battle plan you know, analogy, it, it, what happens uh, in most battle plans don't survive their first contact with the enemy because you're not really thinking about what that enemy might do, what they want. And so all negotiation, combining the process and the outcome, is really an endeavor of thinking what it is that you want clearly uh, and what your other, what the counterpart wants and also what you want to avoid and what your counterpart wants to avoid. When you can think in that term, uh, who it is that's coming, what do they want, and what do they want to avoid, uh, that's going to set up sort of how they're going to negotiate uh, for the deal and how you're going to negotiate for the deal. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a process that um, people make mistakes on all the time, simply, and to put it like this simply, because they forget about who it is that they're negotiating for or with and what it is that that party wants. What did they want to avoid? Ultimately, what you're looking for in any negotiation is, is this arena, this zone, if you will, whereby deals can be reached, agreements can be crafted, uh, but it's, it's got, you got to work for it. And, and oftentimes that work, and I would say the majority of that work happens before you even get to the table. Well, so so let's move right in then to round number three because round number three is preparing for negotiation, and I and man, I understand in theory like the word prepare, but I want to get more detail like how do I physically sit down and prepare? So all right, so let's go to round three. Round number three, preparing for negotiation. So um, before we move into this, I do want to let everybody know that if you're not a member of Learn, L-U-R-N.com, go there right now and especially Learn Center here in Maryland. We got big events coming up in August that you could get tickets to. We're going to be teaching some really killer stuff. So get on Learn's list. We will let you know. So go to L-U-R-N.com, sign up for a free account, and make sure you are on the list, and we'll let you know more about it. All right, so Randy, um, preparing for negotiation. Um, can we get into a little bit more detail? Like, give me the visual, like, how do I do it? What kinds of questions am I asking? What am I answering? Is there, is it, do you, do you have like trained people to go through like a checklist? Is there a preparation I can like, like formula to use your words I can go through to prepare? Sure. Well, uh, look, every negotiation, uh, is going to be about, uh, starting points and stopping points, right? Uh, there's going to be things that you want, things that you want to avoid. There's going to be limits. Um, that you're going to reach whereby a deal can't go forward. 
And so you have to define these things, define what it is that you want, what, what is it you want to avoid. When you define that for your counterpart, what you've just set up, um, our, our goalposts. You think, you know, we've got right now the, the Women's World Cup is taking place, right? There's, there's, uh, there's, the, there's football fever, it says, uh, soccer fever around the world. Um, and, and it's always, it, everything that you do on the, on the field is, is great, but you have to land things within, uh, w- within the goalposts, right? Otherwise, you don't score. Nothing happens. And, and so uh, negotiation, preparation has to fixate on what it is that you want and how, and it has to land within the zone because if it's outside the zone for yourself uh, it's outside the zone for the other party uh, the deal's not going to uh, go forward ultimately and what what that's assessing as well is is sort of a power balance to sort of looking at um what you want um it's usually in the other party's power to be able to give that to you and what they want is usually within your power to be able to give it to them and so uh, that's why you're having a negotiation. That's why you're seeking to trade off things that you want in, in exchange for things that they want. And uh, that bargaining, that back and forth, that trading activity, um, it, it, the skill of negotiation uh, really ultimately determines where in the zone you ultimately uh, win deals. And so, um, the, 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 so I, want you, I want you to have that picture in mind uh, with regard to preparing because um, uh, you, you, when, when you understand limits, and it can be limits of money, it can be limits of time, uh, it can be limits of resources, uh, there's going to be some point by which your proposals land outside the zone. And so you need to, as much as you possibly can, uh, understand um, uh, where that zone is. And I think that's really how you define the zone. Uh, the other thing that you have to do in preparation is you, you have to be crystal clear on your objective and and really not um, confuse your objectives with how you're going to accomplish the objective. Uh, So, um, you know, traveling, um, uh, I'll use this in in the DC area because that's where you're you're located. I lived there for many years. Uh, You know, you can make decisions to go to DC maybe even in, in the proximity of us recording this, you know, tomorrow's uh, is an independence day uh, for, for the states, right? So a lot of people are going to be going to D.C. How you go to D.C. Uh, is, is really the, the methodology, the strategy or so, the strategy how to get there. But, but going to D.C. is your objective. How you go there can be flexible in that way. And so um, when you're thinking about preparing, you have to think for contingencies. You have to think for what if that doesn't work? Uh, what if that doesn't meet their needs? Uh, also on preparing, you're going to start to think about what it is the other side wants, and maybe you're not really clear. And so you have to identify what kind of questions I'm going to have to ask the other side uh, during the engagement. Uh, and, and you might uh, have assumptions that you have to test through that process. And, and so all of that is part of the preparation of negotiation. Again, uh, I, I'll reiterate, most uh, sort of novice negotiators or untrained negotiators uh, never really take time to think about the other side of the table. And so, in essence, they have one half of the goalpost. They kind of know where they were, what they want, but but they're they're starting to, you know, kick uh, kick the ball into other parts of the goalpost that are outside the other end. They, they missed the mark, in essence, because they never really assessed what it is that the other side wants from the negotiation. Uh, and so... Yeah. So how? Okay. So that that's interesting. I love the visual of a goalpost. Um, and I got to be honest, a guilty as charged. I'm thinking about many negotiations that I've probably entered into. I guess at some level, I felt like I know what I want and what they want, but it wasn't written down. I definitely didn't have a defined objective. Um, and so I could see how that would help. But sometimes I'm going into negotiation. I'm not sure what the other party wants, other than they want the best price, right? Like. I, so how do I define what they want if I've not yet sat at the table with them? Is there some kind of pre-negotiation ritual? How do you discover? Do you just ask them like, hey, what is it that you want before we even sit down at the negotiation table? Uh, how do you know what they want? So again, you're, you're making, you have to make some assumptions. There's no doubt. Um, but you know, 
in in the in the uh, battle analogy, you have to know your enemy. I mean, you have to know your counterpart, right? And so there's an element of thinking double in your preparation, where you can even sometimes it helps in some cases to physically place yourself on another side of the table or or dialogue with a colleague someone who has a vested interest in the process and the outcome of your negotiation and play the devil's advocate. Let them, uh, you know, play that part and think about it. What is it? If you were in their shoes, what would you want? If you were in their shoes, what would you want to avoid? Um, and, and so that's going to help you start to define to some degree where the limits are. Uh, in essence, these limits are the, the walkaway points, uh, you know, whereby the negotiations won't happen, the deal won't come together because they have a better alternative. So what are those alternatives? You have to think about all of those things uh, in your preparation. And again, you're not even at the table yet, but you're, you're pre-negotiating these things. And it's best to do it um, uh, by, by, you know, identifying what information you do have and then what information you don't have by which you're going to have to make assumptions until you can engage the other side and then test those assumptions simply by asking them, you know, am I, am I, am I correct in assuming that this is of interest to you? Uh, am I correct in assuming that, um, uh, you know, a, a workable deal would work if it, within this price range or with th these sets of terms? So you can ask these questions of your counterpart once you get to the table. But prior to that, you better be asking them, in anticipation uh, and, and some, you know, deductive logical reasoning, uh, because it's it's gonna it's gonna really help you. So so in preparing, I have another question here. So I've got a goal post, right? And one of the questions I, I probably fits in a different round, but it's on my mind. So I'm gonna ask it now. Um, you got a goal post, and someone could, people would say a true win 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 would be right down the middle. Right. That's just like kind of how we're taught negotiation. You go to, I know it never works out that way, but I'm wondering if I come forth a proposal, should I have my proposal leaning more on towards my side so that I give myself that room? Because there's another a thing that people have taught in negotiation, which I swear it can't work anymore because I feel like everyone's in on it, which is, you know, ask for twice of what you really want. So you give yourself room and you'll meet in the middle um, and you'll end up getting more than what you, you know, were willing to settle for. But I feel like everyone comes to the table with that knowledge. So I'm just trying to figure out, like, is the negotiating world moving more towards, hey, you know what, let's not beat around the bush. Come with the best you've got. I'll come with the best I've got and we'll go somewhere. Or, nah, I'm kind of here on the 80% side, but, uh, yeah, I got some room to move. And both sides come and then they try to work towards the middle. Like, what's your thought on that? Yeah, so I, I know we're going to talk about proposals in a, in a future round. So I, I don't want to um, spill too much of the beans. Okay. In, in yeah. that, but I'll tell you. I'll tell you because you are you are preparing. We're talking about what you do in preparation. Um, it really comes down to uh, you know how much power do you ultimately have in a negotiation? Uh, do you have a do you have the power to to achieve that? And uh, this is going to bleed right into this next round. But uh, a, a lot of the uh, power in negotiation comes from information that you have in the negotiation uh, and knowing where someone's limit is knowing what uh, their their top limit is or their bottom limit is. Um, if you're if you're a, a single source supplier um, to a, you know, d defense, uh, uh, you know, acquisition, talking like in a, in a federal context or something, you're a single source supplier because you have the one widget that they need that they want. That's a lot of power, right? Um, so sometimes you're in that situation and you can claim more value um, it, it's it's really about like anchoring within that zone, uh, that 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 sort of bargaining uh, uh, zone we're talking about. Where you anchor within that is what you're asking, um, and it's really based on how much power do you have to to claim that within within that zone. Um, and it's not just about uh, the power because you have um, more of the resources or more of the time. But I'm telling you, a lot of the power that you can have in negotiation simply comes from information, uh, and and so you you can you can think that you might be able to claim some things, but uh, your proposal, it rarely will your proposal 
be made before you've gathered information, which does happen both before you get to the table and then you're also going to gather information once you get to the table. So let's let's do this because I'm actually really excited about the next round. I'm, I'm actually curious about how you behave during a negotiation and what, what's going on when in physically in the room or on the phone with a negotiation. So let's move right into round number four. All right, so round number four, I've labeled it when in negotiation. Um, what the heck are you supposed to be doing? What are you paying attention for? Are you being a, are you being a Jedi? Like, are you looking at every twitch of the eye and movement of the body? Are there particular questions you are always going to ask to try to get that intel, that information? Walk me through, like, you're walking into a negotiation. What are, what are you going to be doing while in that room? Yeah, so, look, it, negotiation... Um, one can argue fundamentally negotiation is is all about information it's all about information the information that you have the information that they have the information that you can get from the other side and the information that you're willing to give to the other side all of that is going to help both parties uh sort of do the dance and find out whether or not they can uh you know they can find alignment that uh, that they that they like each other and they can do business with each other. So, so it's really about about gathering information, uh, giving information, and so forth. I don't know anyone, uh, and I don't know anyone who's ever walked away from uh, a, a negotiation when the negotiation was done. That they walked away saying, "Wow, I I, I just wish I had uh, less information. I, I just had <laughs> too much information in this negotiation." Most everyone and walks away from the deal wishing that they had more information and wishing they had more time to act on the information uh, that they might have uh, might have acquired. And so you, you have to gather the information before the table, which is the preparation side. And a lot of that, again, is, is built by, based on market data. It's built based on assumptions. But when, once you get to the table, you have to engage your counterpart. You have to ask questions. Uh, and one key part uh, of this process before proposals are really even ever made um, is is you have to uh, you have to be um, uh, inquisitive, uh, religiously curious uh, when you're engaging your counterpart, really to find out um, uh, the information that you that you have and and validate that information or find out more information uh, from the other side. Victor Keim, uh he I love the quote that he has. He says a negotiator should observe everything you need to be part sherlock holmes and part sigmund freud uh it's it's that combination where you're 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 sherlock holmes and you're inquisitive and you're asking questions but you're sigmund freud because you're also trying to read your counterpart right and and uh and, and ask questions you know why are they holding this in high value? Why are they withholding this information? Why are they angling uh, or anchoring in this particular way? So you have to, you have to analyze those things. And uh, the, the best negotiations uh, ultimately do happen face to face because it's, it's, your, it's your best opportunity to build rapport uh, with your counterpart. Um, where you can see one another, you can hear one another, the tone of their voice, their body language, their inflections, the rate of speed, all of these things are going to sort of dress up the conversation. And, and there's really no chance for, for things being nuanced and misunderstood. If you're negotiating over email or over the phone, there's great opportunity for error and, mis and misreading things. Um, so if you can, you know, get face to face with your counterpart. Uh, that's going to serve you the best, and and then what you have to do is is get into a question asking mode. And um, your listeners, I'm sure, uh, you know, is it's pretty commonplace that, that there are certain types of questions that yield certain types of information. And you've got closed ended questions, you've got open ended questions. Um, but my favorite type of question, in my experience, I believe yields the most information in a negotiation. Uh, and, and that is a follow-up question. And so I, I, I use a, the analogy of going to a doctor's office. You know, you get, you get into the doctor's office and the uh, front receptionist hands you a clipboard and the clipboard has what? A bunch of questions on it, right? And all those questions are yes, no, closed-ended questions. Uh, you know, do, do, do you have this? Yes or no. Do your family have this? Yes or no. And you're just going through asking these. 
But when you go to see the doctor in this day and age, it's usually the, the physical assistant, right, a PA, you go back there and you engage with the doctor, and they're asking a different type of question. They're asking open-ended questions about things that you already put on, on the chart, right, or the reason that you're even there. And they're asking questions about, well, tell me more about this. Um, does it does it hurt when you do this or when you do that? Does it you know hurt more in the morning, more in the evening? I, when you wake up, when you when you go to bed, all of these things are follow up types of questions that are more inquisitive. Well, there's just proven data and science behind this that doctors can be assessed as to whether or not they will get sued for malpractice based on their bedside manner, which comes from the types of questions that are being asked in the in the examining room because. And it's the same thing with negotiation. The, the, what's, what's in view here is the rapport or the trust as to whether or not you're going to use this information against me or you're going to use it to help me. And, and I submit to you and your listeners that, that when you're engaged with your counterpart uh, in a negotiation and you're asking these kinds of questions, you can ask the right question in the wrong way. Uh, it's, it's all kinds of opportunities to ask the wrong question. But the, the danger is asking the right question, asking it in the wrong way, where you just come across as, as, um, as sort of probing to the point of manipulating and, and, uh, and getting that. And, and question asking is, is kind of that dance that you have to ask. You have to look and listen and wait for the response. Let them talk. Give them the pleasure. Uh, Adam Grant likes to say this. Give them the pleasure of hearing their own voice. Uh, let them let them talk about these things, uh, and then you can actively listen with all of your body, all of your eyes, uh, with your ears, with your body language. Listen to the other side of what they're saying. This is where rapport is being built, and I'm telling you that information will flow in abundance when you have rapport and trust established, as opposed to when someone does not trust you. And trust in a negotiation is built in this way by asking these types of qualitative, open-ended follow-up questions that demonstrate you really do care about the other side's interests, their limits, what they're trying to achieve, because then proposals can indeed, uh, you know, uh, work in such a way that that lands within the zone, that lands in an area that does meet uh, their needs. No, I mean, that's so powerful. I love that tip. So everyone who's who's listening right now, um, the biggest thing you can do inside of a negotiation is be, as you said, religiously curious. I like that term. Um, negotiators should observe everything. We talked about it, m making sure you're observing body language and all. It's probably the one thing I've said has made the biggest impact in my life and my ability to win in sales has been my observation power. I just, you twitch an eye, I catch it. I, if you twitch in a good way, I catch it, bad way, I catch it. And I know how to then maneuver the conversation away from the painful and towards the joyful. But the bigger thing here, and it's so funny that you mentioned this because it makes me think about our head of sales, our head sales trainer for our sales team, Jeremy Bellotti, who's also our lead transformation coach. The biggest thing he teaches in sales is how to use questions. And, and he lets yeah. people guide themselves through their own journey, but he asks the right questions. I mean, if you go see a therapist, it's amazing. I've always laughed, you know, like a, a, a great therapist. What do they actually do? You're usually the one that comes up with the damn solution in front of them, they, but they know how to ask you the right questions to get to the point. Now, this one thing you said, yeah, well, there's one thing you said that I really want to drive home for everybody because I was not good at this. I've gotten better, but I need to get even better. And that is stop talking and start listening when in a negotiation or in a meeting or in a first introduction or in a sales scenario, I used to talk a lot. And I started realizing that in my talking, I was wasting time and I was giving up way too much information. Um, and I've, I've kind of started flipping it now where I start to really put it back on the person to talk and I ask questions and then, you know, I kind of keep my part short and simple. And I am finding you can physically feel the shift in power in that call or in that meeting when you become the person asking the questions and you talk less and they talk more you're right the rapport is stronger but in a weird way you actually have a stronger power over that conversation and i physically have felt that so i'm really excited that you brought it up because i want everyone to understand that if you're getting into a negotiation or a sales situation please stop talking start listening listen to ask more questions and then and then i, I like that you also brought up ask the right way 
don't don't be like a drill sergeant asking questions like rapid fire because then you're just weird and it's uncomfortable and no one wants to talk to you so <laughs> um, there's a there's a friend of mine my wife and i would uh would, would socialize with them and we go to dinner and you know come back home and my wife she'd be like hey how come you never ask pat any questions and i'm like i, I can't get a word in edgewise the guy's a master he just asks and asks and all my wife hears is me yakking all night long, talking all about myself, right? Well, he accomplished his objective to get me to talk and information flows. Well, you know, he's in the financial services business and it, I'm sure that's helpful for him. Uh, good friend though. So, I mean, just, just understand that. Uh, that's why I like the idea of give people the pleasure of hearing their own voice, let them talk because what are you after? Negotiations and information endeavor. You need information to be able to package or prepare or, or, or make uh, offers uh, that help meet people's needs that land within the goalposts. Yeah, it's funny. I have one friend just like that. And I've actually said he has some kind of mind Jedi superpower. He gets <laughs> complete strangers, people he's meeting for the first time to unveil their life story, deepest, darkest secrets. I've put him in front of people that I've known for 10 years, 12 years. And when I say known, I mean like I've been friends with them. And he will, within a half an hour, learn more about their deepest, darkest moments than I have ever been told. And it's it's uncanny, but you know what? He is a very nice person and he does it in the most unintimidating and curious and just, but he asks you straight up. I've noticed with me now. Now I've actually purposely made it a point to notice when he does it so that I could try to stop him. But he asks in such a lighthearted way, like, oh, how's that going? And he ends up asking you something that you would never tell anybody else. But he asked it so conveniently and, and, and you end up telling him. And so, uh, so brilliant. Um, I want to move right on. I want to move into round number five because this is probably one of my favorite rounds. I got a bunch of questions I want to ask you here. So uh, let's, let's do it. All right. So round number five making offers and proposals. I, I, before I even let you talk, there's two specific questions I have here that maybe as you, as you kind of answer the questions or as you talk, you'll answer the questions. The first one is I brought it up earlier, which was like this whole adage of like, start high if you want to get to the middle and like, you know, that's a good negotiation. And maybe that still works. I guess we still all do it, but innately I feel like it's a dumb strategy because you come to the table and you know, both sides are going to be deploying that. Um, the other question I have is, I, re I don't remember where it was or who it was, but years ago, I'm talking for me 12, 13 years ago, very early in my entrepreneurial career. I remember someone telling me, it was an older gentleman, and it was a very like, hey kid, don't ever throw the price out first. Don't ever make the first proposal. And it's played at me since then. But sometimes it's so tough because it's like you just want to get to the point and say the thing and you're trying to banter and both parties don't want to throw the number out because maybe you'll go too low. Maybe you'll go too high. So those are two big questions. One is that old adage of start high. So you reach in the middle. Does that still work? And the second is, <laughs> is there a downside to being the first person to throw a number on the table? Yeah, those are those are great questions or kind of classic questions. Um, uh, does it still work? Yeah, uh, of course. It works, it's just, does something work better is really what it comes down to, right? So you can, you can uh, anchor high, um, there, there's, there, there are rules, there's a mid, midpoint rule that uh, a lot of negotiator, uh, negotiation theory talks about a midpoint rule where you're gonna anchor high and then you're gonna have a counter anchor and then there's gonna be a, a, a midpoint uh, split the difference anchor. And uh, it's the splitting the difference which becomes the dangerous uh, you know, uh, point in a negotiation. Uh, and the reason is that, that splitting the difference seems like a fair, reasonable, win-win approach to negotiation. But in essence, one party could have won more because they had more power. Uh, and, and just agreeing to split the difference uh, is not always the best solution for that. And I'll just tell you that if you anchor too high, the other is going to counter anchor uh, in their counter offer, and, and it's just going to resort to a, a midpoint rule. We see this in real estate all the time uh, because it's just the price, and that's what they're negotiating over, and uh, they're trying to land, you know, somewhere. Let's just split the difference, and you can propose that. It's just that you might have other proposals that might uh, uh, might get you more uh, in the negotiation. Um, so, what was your other question? 
the other question was, is there a downside to being the first person to throw the price oh, out? Yeah, yeah. yeah, the downside to, the, to being the first. Um, well, I tie it back to the information that you have. Uh, so if you know, uh, if, if you have enough information that you know what a good deal looks like, uh, then there is advantage to proposing first, right? There is an advantage to that. Um, if, you're, uh, if you don't know, <laughs> Um, then the risk is, of course, that you, uh, you, you undershoot or you overshoot. Um, so it, generally speaking, in, in negotiation uh, approaches, negotiation theory certainly uh, would be my perspective, um, that you're, you're usually in a better position if you uh, initiate um, solutions to problems um, and uh, be in you know, conflict resolution or you know, putting, putting a number on the table, putting an offer on the table and so forth. Uh, you think about it back in the real estate space, that's what happens. A lot of times people think buyers are the first ones you know, you know, making an offer. Well, that's actually a counter offer because the seller puts the property on the market, they list it. That's an offer to the market. That is the first offer. And so in essence, it's an anchor point. And uh, what people do is they're responding or reacting to that, to, to that offer that's on the table. And that does give uh, the seller the upper hand in that way. So. Uh, but in the rare case that you didn't do your homework, you really don't know the value of something, then uh, you know you do risk that. But when when you come down to you break it down brass tacks, um, you know there's no real uh, loss uh, if you just tell someone what you want. <laughs> um, and uh, because it, it, otherwise, what's going to happen is you force the other side to guess, and rarely do people ever. Uh, guess accurately, right? They're either going to, you know, guess too high, guess too low. They're not going to meet your needs. So it's it's usually going to serve you better uh, just to tell people what you want. And, and that would be uh, my position. Related to that, though, we think of proposals being really uh, sort of solutions to resolving conflict. Um, I, I would want to address more, not so much in terms of who goes first. Um, uh, there's there's good reason for the, for the purpose that I just stated. Uh, but probably more often than not, what I see in uh, negotiation and negotiation training or just people at the table is that um, they, they, their, their offers are not clear. Uh, they're not clear offers. Um, and they're usually one-sided offers, and they're not believable offers. And those are the, the challenges. So they're, they're not clear. They're not taking into account both sides' interests. And they're really not defendable or believable offers. They're way outside the goalposts, right? So uh, that's a bigger challenge uh, in terms of the credibility that a negotiator has at the table. Um, so, you know, my advice would be you, you want to be clear about your offer, what it is that you're wanting, have no ambiguity with that. Um, and and you, you, you want to make these offers taking into account the information that you gathered by, by the homework that you did um, and and make sure that you're uh, not only fixated on the outcome of your own interests. You, it's, a, it's a duality. You have to not merely look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of the other side. And that's where winnable deals, I think, are, are ultimately put together. You know, I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill, and I, I'll tell you that this is a cardinal problem, number one problem in, uh, in negotiation in, in a political or public policy context, is their... their um, they're, they're vague and they're uh, one-sided, self-interest, and unreasonable. It's everything that is the opposite <laughs> of what makes a good, a good deal. And then you wonder, why can't things get done? Well, you look at what things are being proposed, and they're way outside the, 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 the zone. And they're, they're, um, they're, they're just uh, over the top, and it causes people to react. It causes people to walk away before every negotiation even begins, and it's just a problem on every on every front. Uh, so politics does it the deadlock ultimately, and it costs the casualty, I'll just tell you, the casualty of this. When you don't have, uh, you know, when you have unclear uh, offers that are being made, uh, or you're just lopsided self-interest offers, the casualty is going to be time uh, and money and ultimately the relationship uh, of that person that you're negotiating with. And if you have to negotiate with that person, then the, the, you're going you're gonna to be locking horns every single time because you're really not making reasonable offers.
So let's do this. Let's talk about this. You brought it up. You brought politics. So we're going to pivot here for a second. I have a question, and it has to do with negotiation. It was one thing that just doesn't make sense to me, right? Is So one thing that does make sense to me, let's start with that. You talk about goalposts, and you say that when you make your first proposal, if your first proposal is way outside of either goalpost, it's like, don't go for that because it's just, it's a waste. It's unbelievable. It's not setting up in good faith. So even if you're leaning towards your side, be at least in the goalpost. That that automatically makes the offer more believable. So I love that visual. I continue to love it. It's great to to sit and through, think through that every time. One thing that's baffled me, and, and I'm not going one way or the other, Democratic or Republican. I'm just kind of saying both one, against one another. Every single thing right now when I listen you know, they, you know, the Republicans will propose one thing and the Democrats will propose one thing. And I sit back as a complete bystander. I don't know anything. I've never been on Capitol Hill. And I'm like, what the heck? You know, they're not going to go for that. You know, they're not going to go for that. It's obnoxious. You're way out. And then what happens is they come to the table with their proposals. And I'm again, watching through just news saying, why are you even meeting? There's no point. No one's going to agree to that. They have a fight. They leave. And then their next proposal, both sides went the opposite direction. They're further out of the goalpost. And I sit and I wonder, so my question to you having been in that is, is that just ego? What's doing that? Because surely they're smart people. They got to know they're walking into something that's not going to work. So why are they still doing it? Is it just, is it pandering to the voters? Is it trying to look strong? Is it political or is it just ego? Is it literally blind ego? Yeah, well, it's a it's a great question, and uh, it's it's the answer is all of the above, uh, to okay. be quite frank. Um, it, it, in, a, in a political context, um, you have so many dynamics at play. Uh, you have politics, of course. You have parties. You have uh, you know constituencies. Uh, you have the press. Uh, you have these complexities that um, lead to bad behavior that isn't really focused on um, a a good solution, a good resolution. And a lot of times because they don't have to, and so they just have to pander, they do the things that just look like they're trying and then framing it so that the other party looks bad and they're gonna run with that in the media. And so uh, unlike commercial negotiations, where you know you want the hamburger uh, more than you want the five dollars in, in your pocket, and I happen to sell hamburgers, and I want the five dollars more than than I want the hamburger, right? So we have a meeting of the minds. So there's mutual interest here, uh, and it just doesn't happen like that in politics. Now, that's on the big ticket items where they know they're not going to get compliance consensus. They're not going to get gain in, in that way, and so it becomes a political football. They don't have to really resolve anything. Uh, it, but I, I do know this for a fact on the margins, on the peripheral, there's a lot of micro negotiation that does happen. And there are bills that do get advanced that are addressing the issues. It's just the big ticket items that just move in these really uh, uh, slow or extreme ways. And just, you just know that they're not gonna be able to get it done. On the margin though, there are things that are happening. Unfortunately, it's not newsworthy and people don't pay attention to it. And so, um, you know, that's a problem. The other thing is, I would I would submit that in in a political context, most of what happens on Capitol Hill uh, resorts to uh, strong arming or it's just persuasion, manipulation tactics. It's really not negotiation. Negotiation is about giving and getting and exchanging things of value and trying to work things out. What happens also in a political context is that you can have, you know, House and Senate both have to agree on something, uh, then it has to get signed off by the uh, executive branch. Um, and so uh, a lot of times what happens between the House and the Senate, especially because we're split, is things get worked out in conference, behind closed doors, and that's where the fine tuning happens and deals ultimately do get worked. So there's progress, um, but then there's Congress. <laughs> got it, got it. All right, well, listen, I, I, I kind of want to move right because we're naturally flowing right towards uh, round number six. So let's start that. Okay, so round number six, um, it's after the first proposal. It's it's that time, it feels like that moment when you ask a girl to marry you and you're on your knee and they, they just don't say anything. It's like that three seconds of 
pure anxiety. You know, it's like I just asked you something. So you could go one or two ways, right? I mean, you ask a girl to marry you, she says yes or no, because it maybe is really a no. So it's a yes or a no. Now you make your first proposal, you've prepared for it, you've defined your goalposts, you've been thinking about it, you've deployed all your best tactics, you got all the information you could, you put the power in your side and you make the first proposal. And if they say yes, great, we move right on to the next step, we sign paperwork and we'll move into the next round, which is what do you do after that? But now they say no, right? They're like, yeah, that's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That's not gonna work. What do you do? Like, how do you, cause that, that could also, they could just say, well, we don't like that deal. Or they could be like, are you out of your mind? Like you're way off. I guess, do you, do you wrap up that particular session and try to come back for another one or you keep going? Yeah. So it, it's a great question. And there's not, um, I mean, there's tactics, of course, things that you can consider doing and, and approaches. It, it is, it is unique to the deal. I would say there's so many other factors. What's the level of of relationship that you have with this party? Uh, is this a must-have, must deal with this party? Um, you know, is there has there been history? Have I done deals with this party before? All of these, you know, what um, uh, you know, what time variable do we have? What relationship variable do we have? All of these shape uh, the answer to the question that you're asking. Okay, so um, but in principle, in principle. How, how I like to say it is um, is that you want to be able to always dress your yes and dress your no. So you never want a naked yes. You never want a naked no. You want to put some clothes on it. Uh, so there are conditional yeses or conditional nos are always best to kind of help keep the negotiation moving forward where you're not giving up so much value or you're just not uh, stuck in a deadlock and, and then nothing's happening at all. Um, you know, if you're if you're inclined to say yes or or inclined to say no, probably the key really advice is um, is is just pause. You don't want to cause any uh, reason to give buyers or sellers remorse that someone accepted a deal too quickly or someone said no too quickly. Um, so try to find a way uh, to um, you know come back, review your objectives, review. Um, whether or not you got everything that you're really wanting, are you within the zone? Um, it, it, sometimes people say no, and it's just a tactic. They're just trying to, you know, it's a hard bargaining competitive tactic just to see if you'll flinch, right? And see if they can move you to their side. That's a power play and uh, it can backfire. That's the real risk uh, associated with that. But when you, when you know, when you, when I would say time, money and or time and relationship are, are usually the biggest two casualties of a negotiation that doesn't work time and relationship and oftentimes you those are two precious commodities that are that are very hard to redeem uh, you know you, you the sand is out uh, of the of the timer bottle and you just you, you can't get it back in right and the relationship is tarnished and you can't restore that and so you've got to protect both of those uh, in what you propose to do or how you choose to respond uh, to a, an offer that's on the table. Um, if the time and relationship variable are still at a point um, where you might be able to look at alternatives to what was just rejected, um, then then you need to do that, right? You need to take, take uh, and, and look and get creative and try to find other ways that you uh, could turn your no into yes, for instance. And, and uh, but, but that again, that requires time it requires a relationship still being there and it requires someone to you know step away and 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 give some creative out of the box thinking toward uh, a path forward that's there um that said uh Anik, i would just tell you not every deal is winnable you know and nor should it be um the the, the mistake that a lot of times people make is that they they try to get a deal at all costs now, sometimes you have to get a deal at all costs, and that's a that's not a favorable position to be in. But when you have alternatives and you can think about your alternatives, it gives you power at the bargaining table. It gives you the power to say no. It gives you the power to resist and and, and explore alternatives and try to get a bigger uh, win or a little better deal. And that's really what it comes down to. And that, I'll tell you, that comes back to your preparation again. It really comes back to you really understanding um, uh, how much strength do you have within this uh, negotiation, how much power you have and how, how it's going to uh, look uh, throughout the process. Ah, that's uh, that is so awesome. Um, love it. All right. So 
time and relationship very very powerful so you don't want to necessarily push a deal so much um if it could end up costing you a, a ton of time which you could have spent with negotiating someone else or something else but then relationship um that's key Uh, before we go to round seven, there there was something that you mentioned during our pre-interview that I purposely chose not to ask you about at that time because I thought I would ask you live here. And that was you said, never negotiate only on one one variable. I didn't exactly understand that, but it sounded very wise. So can you, can you dive a little deeper into that? Yeah. So look, if you think about it, think back of any negotiation that you've been in. Um, so often, uh, you know, we... And it is, this is also characteristic of being focused just on the outcome. You know, I, I have to get the lowest price or I have to get the most money out of this deal. Uh, so often uh, that one variable is, is, is a monetary component, right, it's price. Um, but sometimes it could be other variables that are just, but the, but the point is that when you're stuck with just one variable, it really just becomes, in essence, it becomes a, um, a, a type of haggle. Uh, you know, it's think of the, of the, the bizarre in a, in a some foreign country where, um, foreign to, to you, that is, uh, uh, situation where you're, you're having to uh, dicker over the price, right? Back and forth, back and forth, chewing it down. And, and the, the analogy, it's kind of widely used, uh, but I think it fits and it paints the picture as just the two, two dogs on the end of, of a bone. It, it's a zero-sum win-lose outcome. It, only one is going to win. And people have oftentimes uh, too often, um, liken, even though I've been using this, uh, the, you know, the, the analogy of the goalpost, right? But it's a sporting analogy. And guess what? Only one women's team in the Women's World Cup is going to win. And I'm personally hoping it's the U.S. Okay, I just have to say that, right? But but that's where I am. Um, I, I, but only one team is going to win. That means the others are not going to win. <laughs> and so um, the, when you're haggling, you're not negotiating and you 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 you're forced into a haggle when you have only one variable and that's that's uh that's where a lot of times negotiations start and negotiations end and it's never a helpful uh, thing to do it's really the worst form of negotiation because it destroys the relationship and burns the clock and kills it so um w w the counter to this sort of the the remedy to this if you will is always think about what other things might be important uh, to, to the other party here. And I'll give you a, a story uh, that a great, great story. It's not my negotiation, but I love it and I talk about it because it was so apropos to this point. In, in a real estate context, oftentimes things do boil down to just price and people forget about all of the other things that they want uh, in, in the transaction. So someone is buying a house, but they're not buying the commodity house and in, 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 a, in a price, they're buying a place to live, right? They're buying uh, a place, a neighborhood. They're buying a, a, a family room uh, where they can have fun times and memorable experiences. And the same way a seller is, is not just merely selling a commodity on the marketplace, right? They're selling a place that they have lived, but they're also selling to get resources to go and do something else uh, with the resources. And so um, when you forget about those additional variables, you're stuck with the one and it becomes a, it becomes the haggle. This story it took place in the real estate uh, situation and it was a California real estate deal. Uh, the, the market had tanked. It was at the bottom. It was starting to come up again. We start to see multiple offers, competitive bids on, on real estate transactions and the competing variable all the time was just price. You know, and so, you know, this person's going to offer 500, you're going to offer 510 and 530 and you're just going to keep going up and, until you get the highest bid. It's an auction, right? not a good situation well a friend of mine real estate professional negotiator uh who who uh was on the buyer's side of the transaction helping a client knew that his client would not be able to compete on price knew that his client didn't have the resources to, to bid this up right but he thought about the other variables on the other side of the table what might be of interest to the other party and as he looked around he realized this is central coast california this is rose country he looked around and he saw that this older couple who had the house, who owned the house for many, many years, had beautiful roses in their in their backyard, in this rose garden. And so they submitted their offer, not as the highest price, but they added another variable and they offered this. Here's our offer. 
this is as high as we can go, but we're willing to have your roses professionally uprooted and professionally transported and replanted at your new home at our cost. He won the deal. He won the deal because he recognized that there are other variables that trump price, that, that, that really are bigger triggers for people than money alone. Money is important, but it's not the only variable. And if you leave it as the only variable, it's who can outdo the other party. But the winnable deals are to say, hey, here's my price, but here's the other things. I can't be flexible on this, but there's other things that I can be flexible. And I think that that other area of flexibility is going to scratch where people are itching, is going to tease out and meet the needs of those other people. And I think those are that those are creative negotiation solutions that keep you from just negotiating on the one variable. I love that. So everyone listening, I mean, you really should take a minute to figure out what is the other party you want. I have a very, very similar story and it's, it's hilarious. I won't talk about who it was with, although someone might be able to figure it out. Anyway, so I was in the process of, I have a partnership with a very big brand and so everything's fine. I'm, you know, but sometimes getting video footage and video content from this particular brand can be tough because, well, they just don't care. They don't want to, and they're busy living their lives. And I was talking to someone on their team and they told me, listen, don't talk about money. This person has plenty of money. It's not why they're going to take time out of their day to drive down here and do a video shoot with you, but they love, they love their message going out. They, they think in how many people did they reach that they think in numbers. So reposition and tell them how many times that interview with you or the video will be seen. And so wow. it was a, it, it was an ad we were trying to shoot for Facebook. So the nice thing about Facebook ads is they get millions of views real quick if you're out you know, doing advertising with that. And so I, I actually went back and looked at my track record and I found that this person's top videos that would do well for our advertising would get about three to 4 million views plus probably close to 30 to 40 million impressions. And that was with what I led saying, can I please have 30 minutes of your time? Because the video that we put together, your message, I believe will be seen by over 3 million people and your face will be seen at least 30 to 40 million times on Facebook. And it was like, yeah. bam, it was an instant. Uh, it was actually, it was funny because I was asking for a date that was three weeks out and the person replied and said, can you make that sooner? Like, can you come next week to do this? And I've never had that response. So, so, so true. But here we are. I would have thought leading with money. Everyone wants to make money. You're in business. You want to make money. But this person, I mean, yeah, they want to make money. But that's not enough of a reason to get them to uproot them from, from their normal day. So it was really interesting. I love that. Um, Anik, let me let me let me dovetail on that because what's what's in view with your the person you're you're mentioning here? Um, there's two principles of persuasion. I mean, we say we talk about negotiation. Negotiation is really a give and take, right? You got to give up concessions and you got to try to get concessions from the other side. Uh, but persuasion is really sort of unilateral. It's trying to convince the other side to do something that's that's in your self interest, right? But true effective persuasion works when you can persuade them to do something that they see or perceive or you've framed that they see it as in their self-interest. And that's what you, in essence, did, right? And so that, that so the, the two of these, negotiation and persuasion, they're, they're two uh, sides of the same coin. And back to the proposal making, you need to make proposals and what you're doing, you make, make offers, right? And you need to frame it in such a way that it teases out and the other party can see that it's in their self-interest. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, um, a, a great book on, uh, on persuasion. Robert Cialdini, a professor here at Arizona State University, uh, has written extensively about that. But two key principles of persuasion that I would say have to be present here. One is the principle of self-interest. And people are motivated to do what's in their self-interest. Fundamentally, what's in it for me, right? It's the Witham principle, right? The other thing is it has to be sound and logical. It has to be has to make sense. And if you think about it, these are teasing out both the right and left hemispheres of our brain. These are emotional things, right? We tell them, hey, these are all the bells and whistles and fancy things uh, that are going to meet your interests and your needs. Those are self-interest. And here's the logical why reason why this all makes sense. Uh, that's the sound logical component. And both when both are present, you have a very powerful. Uh, formula, if you will, if you want to use formula, there it is, uh, it, making uh, pitches, 
making offers, making proposals. You have to bring in self-interest and sound logic. It's got to make sense to the party. And they have to see that it's meeting their needs. And so there you go. No, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's awesome. I really appreciate you bringing that out, even though I didn't catch me doing that. But now it will be more, I'll be a lot more vigilant of it to make sure that I'm always aware of multiple factors that are involved. Um, all right, well, let, listen, let's move into our final round because uh, this was one where you again said something during the pre-interview that really caught my attention. Um, and so let's go to round number eight. Okay, round number eight, leaving a negotiation. So here, here's me walking into a negotiation room in like my head. I'm putting my war paint on. I got my, you know, I got my guards on, my elbow pads. I got a sword. I'm drawing it out. And it's like, I'm going to war. Let's do this. I'm going to win. I'm going to kick your butt. I'm going to get the best deal ever. And I think that's how I visualize a negotiation. It is a me or you. And when I, <laughs> so when I was pre-interviewing you, I'm like, yeah, we're going to learn strategies, how to take the person down and like do crazy stuff. And I think the first thing you said within the first like 30 seconds, you're like, you've got to create a win, win, win. You've got to create a situation in which the person wants to do business with you again. And, and I instantly remember thinking, I'm like, oh, I never thought about that. Like, you know, I, I could burn through a lot of people very quickly if I just every time I work with someone, I win. I cut them down with a sword, but then they're not alive to fight another day with me. Um, and so leaving a negotiation, let's say we we got it. All right. We or we didn't. I mean, we're about to walk away from the table. What's important? What's really important to you? You mentioned, you know, the two biggest potential costs of failed negotiations being time and relationship. I imagine they're probably the could be the two biggest costs of one uh, negotiations as well. But like, yeah, how what is your ritual when you leave a negotiation and when you're closing down? Yeah. So, well, again, it does depend whether you have a deal or you don't have a deal. So if you if you have a deal, uh, you certainly want to close down the the negotiations when when you've met your needs and, you, and they've met theirs, right? Uh, you don't want to keep pressing because uh, it's it lingering over a deal um, can can be problematic, especially if you got a bigger win in the negotiation. Um, if you didn't get a deal, you you certainly to, to the you use the quote that I always like. It is that you want to preserve the relationship to and live to fight another day. Uh, rarely, uh, Anik, do we ever have only one shot uh, at at something, um, and and we live in a small world, right? Arguably, especially with technology, you live in a small world. People come around, you see each other again. You have uh, future opportunities, so you want to preserve the relationship uh, at all costs. And this is why I, I told you that it's so important to not just focus on the outcome, but the process. The process is really about the people. And, and how you're engaging with the people during the process in order to have a successful outcome because that true metric of success a successful negotiation is not did i win and did they lose but will they do business with me again and will i be willing to do business with them again so preserve the relationship at all costs if you're going to do anything at all costs it is that um, because of referral business because of relationship business and all of that there's an aspect of just agreeing to disagree there's a lot of opinions that get floated around in the negotiation at the negotiation table, and you can get hung up on that and arguing over silly stuff that you'll never come to an agreement on. This is characteristic of certainly of, of Washington. Uh, they're they're discussing or debating value elements that are so deep within someone's core of their being or of their party that they're never going to change that. So it's not going to be helpful to debate things that you just have different opinions on. You've got to move things forward on on substantive. Uh, matters that you can uh, find agreement on. So uh, agree to disagree, but then agree to always keep the door open uh, for future business. Um, Indira Gandhi said that you can't shake hands with a clenched fist. And I love that quote. So there should be no clenched fists in negotiation. Always look to keep the relationship healthy and keep it alive. Um, uh, another another great quote um, I just read this the other day. Actually, I saw a, a meme or something on LinkedIn, uh, and it was of Bruce Lee. And uh, he was his, his uh, understudy had commented. He says, "You know, uh, you know, Master Lee, uh, you you teaching me to fight, but you're always talking about peace." And he couldn't reconcile these two things. You're teaching me to fight, but you're always talking about peace. And and Master Lee uh, responds, and he said, "Because." It's better to be a warrior in the garden than to be a gardener 
in the war. <laughs> and I love that. And so I don't want to diminish or take away your warrior mindset. You've got to come prepared to tangle, but how you do it, right? Uh, it, you can do that in such a way that, that disenfranchises, uh, you know, and, and destroys your opponent, or you can do that in such a way that builds up and cultivates and, and, uh, and, and bears fruit within your relationship. So two principles here. If time, if you have time still left in the deal, but no relationship, uh, you may have to wait until that dynamic changes, right? That, that the person changes. Um, you, you're trying to, to win business with someone and, the, and the, the buyer on the other side keeps blocking the deal, blocking the deal, don't want to do business with you. And you have to find a workaround. You, you know, at some point, that person is not going to be there anymore. Uh, at some point, the, the, the guard changes, right? The, the, and so um, that, that's, an important, uh, that's an important factor. This is the danger we have on the world stage because people are looking at President Trump and, and, and saying, you know, well, can we just wait him out? You know, maybe in 2020 he's not uh, the president anymore, or 2024 he's he, he'll be termed out. You know, can we just wait him out? So there is an element of dynamics in, that people do change, and circumstances change. The clock changes, right? So if you have time, but the relationship, you might have to wait for the person to change. If you have the relationship, but no time, then look for the next opportunity, right? Uh, people work on on uh, RFPs all the time. There, there there's new opportunities to bid on new business. When, you, when the negotiation didn't work, find out what you can after the, 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 the negotiation has, has failed or you had a deadlock or you didn't win it. Uh, try to get the person when their guard is down and find out what didn't work. I, I had a bid um, years ago, a training bid for some of the training that I do with a city here in Arizona. And uh, I, I submitted the proposal, respond to an RFP. I didn't win the business, but when it was done, I was able to call the buyer and say, help me out, help me understand, uh, what is it? And so she was able to tell me, you know, this is where you were strong, this is where you were not strong, this is how you can change. And that's good information for the next round, but I preserved the relationship and she's gonna be there still at the table. So I have the relationship, but I just look for a new time. So, you know, here's a fact, external factors create opportunities, external factors change opportunities, destroy opportunities, but they create new opportunities. So always be looking for the dynamic of the market or what's happening there. New markets create new opportunities all the time. Uh, you've got a bunch of entrepreneurs who listen to you uh, and uh, and they're, they're in the role they're in. You're in the role you're in because you seized opportunities that came about. And these are this is not static, it's a dynamic thing. So there's always gonna be new opportunities, new people and new reasons to come back together. But keep in mind that the real objective here is you know you, negotiation you can't do negotiation without engaging another party yeah it says you can negotiate with yourself i guess in a sense but ultimately you need someone else it, this is a people business negotiation is a people business and if you're good with people you will be a good negotiator uh, and that's that's where i think it, it really results uh, in in a successful outcome uh you know scott work has fantastic resources uh, you know, we do we do training for corporate America. We do training for entrepreneurs all the time. We have resources that help people. Um, you know, I I, I, t I told you I, I wanted to be able to give something away to your listeners. Uh, yes, please. Uh, talk about dirty tricks. Um, uh, how to spot them? So we've got a free uh, download that will help you. Top ten dirty tricks you encounter in negotiation. How to spot them? Be able to respond to them. Uh, to quote Chris Voss, who is a hostage, FBI hostage negotiator, he said, the worst negotiation you can be in is one that you don't even know is happening. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the, the book that he wrote on Never Split the Difference, a fantastic read, but it, you don't want to be caught off guard. And uh, most negotiations, uh, most most of the time, we, we, we're not successful in negotiation because we fall prey to the dirty tricks and tactics that other people are using on us. And so this is a great resource that I think your your listeners would benefit. How, how do they get it? Uh, Where do they go to get it? Yeah. So, so uh, uh, look, there's a uh, uh, we've set up a website uh, specifically for your listeners. It's called discover dot dot com slash learn l u r n, and they can get that free download uh, called Dirty Tricks and How to Spot Them. Top ten dirty tricks and how to spot them from Scott Work.
I, I, yeah, and we'll have it in the description, everybody. So if you go to onicpodcast.com, we'll make sure we pop the URL in there. But uh, so www.discover.scottwork. I just want to spell Scottwork real quick so we make sure we have, everyone has that. Is yeah, it so SC? Discover.scottworkusa, S C O T W O R K USA dot com slash learn. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Uh, I suggest everybody go get this and learn as much as you can. Randy, if someone wants to get a hold of you or just follow you or see what you're up to, where can they go? Are you active on any social media profiles or any 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 way for yeah. people to get a hold of you? Uh, LinkedIn. Yeah, come on, come on and connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, right. I, I, I'm, I'm there. Uh, I'm engaged on it. I, I write some articles for uh, for Scott Work, and then also visit ScottWorkUSA.com. There's other resources there and videos and. And uh, tips and uh, and and re resources. Uh, check out one of our open courses. We have a, a, a slew of them coming across the country in October. A lot of opportunities. And if you're with a company, we train. I'll just tell you. You know, this is a personal testimony. It's closed out here, Anik. But all the negotiation that I ever took from other training companies, I walked away feeling sort of ethereal, sort of smart about negotiations, academically smart. It wasn't until I took a Scott Work course where I walked away feeling better, more skillful at the negotiation table. And that's what we do. We teach behavior change. And if you're serious about negotiation, uh, we can promise return on investment for what you uh, put into the negotiation. You will get back out uh, at tenfold. And uh, it's helped a lot of people. We've been doing it for 43 years around the world. So I hope you visit us, visit us on one of our courses as well at scottworkusa.com. Yeah, absolutely. Randy, it has been such an honor. Thank you so much for such amazing information. Everybody take action. Listen to this again if you need to. Now, look, remember, if you are listening on the podcast, go to onicpodcast.com. Make sure you leave us a great review. Follow us on all the various platforms that we're on. And then, of course, if you're on YouTube, come on, leave a comment below. Talk to Randy. Tell him what you thought. I know he's going to read them. Let's, he took time away from his business, his family to be here with us. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button icon make sure you hit the bell icon on youtube make sure you do everything you can and tell everybody you can about the fighting entrepreneur podcast uh it has been absolutely awesome randy thank you and thank you to everyone else for listening and remember when life pushes you stand straight smile and push it the heck back come on go out and fight for your dreams entrepreneurs i'll see you on the next one thanks for listening to the fighting entrepreneur with your host onyx and